Hey everybody, welcome back to another live stream and Merry Christmas if you are actually watching this on the day it goes live. I hope you've really been enjoying our month long series of Silent Night in the NICU. We've been focusing on sleep, we've focused on attachment, and now for the last one of, of the month, we are gonna focus on giving. Giving back with our knowledge, our time, our expertise to others who are not, not as fortunate as us to have all the educational resources that we have. That is one thing I'm really passionate about helping people who are in underserved areas. And if you know me, you know I've been to Africa on missions in the NICU. I have, I have served and lived in Mexico, and it has been an amazing opportunity as a nurse to be able to give back knowledge I have and to help others who are doing their best to care for babies and families in their part of the world. Um, I love to travel and teach. You know, I go all over the world and I love giving back a little bit of the knowledge I have to help others who are doing what they can to take care of babies and families wherever they live. So this week is a presentation by Philip Platt. He's going to be sharing with you a program that he helped to develop that is giving nursing education in Ethiopia. I really hope that you enjoy this presentation, that you enjoy his story stories and that it just fills you with that spirit of giving, the spirit of the holidays, and that it's just something a little different, but I think really valuable. I know many of you want to go and do missions and to give back with these education programs that are available through these organizations, and it's always hard to know which organization to partner with. So I think that what Philip does is, number one, he has an organization that you can work with, or he gives you kind of a framework of the things to, to look up. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us bring you more free content, and it tells YouTube that you like these videos. So go ahead and do that if you haven't already. And if you wanna get some of the other resources, the slides and reminders about our weekly live streams, <laughs> scan the QR code here on the screen or click the link in the show notes below. You'll be taken to a page where you can put in your email address, and that will give you access to everything as it comes live so you won't ever miss a thing. We have a huge lineup for 2024 for you, so you just don't want to miss anything. So without further ado, here's Philip. So our next presenter is Philip Platt, and Philip Platt is a neonatal nurse practitioner working for a private neonatal practice in Texas. He has 32 years of working in a level three and 26 years as an NNP. I actually have known Philip for a really long time. <laughs> And he and I actually, I'm not even sure how we originally met. I think you answered an ad. Is that right? Uh -huh. So when I was working for Brain Z many years ago, we were looking for clinical specialists yeah. to go out and to do education in different units. And Philip Platt actually answered one of the ads and we interviewed him. And it was amazing to work with Philip all those years that we worked together with that company that, that doesn't exist anymore. But... It was really fun. We got to travel all over, had amazing meetings, and it's been fun to watch his career since then. But he is responsible for leading in, and coordinating quality improvement initiatives with nine years of experience in Ethiopia. And he is the co-founder of Wax and Gold, a nonprofit advocating for women's and children's fundamental rights to essential health care in the developing world. So we've invited him today to present about this because I know that for many of you, that you have mentioned that going and serving in other countries is a real heart-centered thing you would like to do in the future. And so I want you to hear what Philip's been doing, but to also be inspired by the opportunities that he and his organization offer. So please help me welcome Philip Platt. Hi, y'all. So I'm going to hopefully take you away from the cerebral aspect of this conference. So as we go through these slides, for, first of all, oh, so I've changed this talk probably five times in the last two weeks. So the last time I changed it was two nights ago. So if you have the printed copy, close it. I have a little bit of extra data that's actually going to be presented in those slides. I have no interest other than I'm a co-founding member of Wax and Gold. The learning objectives, that hasn't changed. So if you are like me, where is Ethiopia? When I first originally heard about this opportunity to provide my time and my volunteer service, I had to go to a map and look to see where Ethiopia was. Ethiopia is on the eastern side of Africa. By the way, during the Ebola outbreak, I was actually in Ethiopia. And that was an interesting time because we really didn't know much about that. But it was all on the western side, so Ethiopia didn't have to deal with that. So when we look at Ethiopia itself, Ethiopia is a pretty large land mass. When I say pretty large, it's about the size of Texas. 
But when you look at the population, there's about 100 million people in Ethiopia. And statistically, 65% of the population of Ethiopia is less than 25 years of age. So they have a very young population. 80% of the people are in rural. 70 live on about one US dollar per day. Now, the majority of the people that we work with in Addis Ababa, which is the capital city, they make much more money than that. But if you look at the largest number of population is in the rural, you can see where outside of the cities it's pretty poor. When you look at the religion of Ethiopia, 45% is Orthodox Christian, which until I arrived there, I didn't understand that and know that, but it's a very high spiritual country. About 35% of them are Muslim, and the two get along quite well. Probably one of the neatest things about Ethiopia is that they are the only country in Africa that has not been colonized. Most of Africa has been colonized at one time by a Euro European country, and Ethiopia still has its heritage. It did go through a really horrible time. That's probably the time that you guys can probably remember when you saw on TV and you saw all those children that were skin and bones and flies all over them and that kind of thing. That was the image I had in my mind when I first heard about going over to Ethiopia. That was during the time of what was called the Derg. The Derg was a communistic uh, party that overthrew the, the, uh, the king, King Haile Selassie, and they killed him and many of his family. And, and that was the end of the monarchy that they had in Ethiopia. They went through that period of time in the early 70s to the mid-90s. And they've been pretty strong since then. Addis Ababa is the capital city. There, there are, depending on who you read, there's four to six million people alone that's in Addis Ababa. The elevation of Addis is 8,000 feet. So the first time that I went to Ethiopia, it was in July 2009. And thinking about you're going to Africa, it's near the equator, it's July. What do you think the weather would be? Hot. hot. So I packed nothing but clothes for hot weather. Only to learn after I get there that it's their winter months. Now, their winter months is nothing like what I have. It. I'm from Amarillo, Texas. We have Last week it was 17 degrees, today it's 70 something degrees. Where I live, we, we live all seasons, sometimes in one day. There, I had short sleeves, I was running around, people are looking at me like I'm crazy. They're wearing ski coats, and I uh, couldn't understand why I would be in uh, short sleeve shirts, and it wasn't uh, on purpose. I purposely wore short sleeve, but I didn't know the climate. So this is just a view from satellite. You can see it's very populated. What I want to do is a little bit of history and take you of how we got involved in Ethiopia of all places. So in the early 1970s, actually in the 60s, there was a man named Asfal Yemeru. Asfal, he, his, he grew up on a farm and he was a shepherd for his father for the flock of animals that they had. And when he was a young boy, around nine years old, they went into the capital city of Addis and there was something about being in that city environment that captivated him. About a year later, he left his family by himself. He went to Addis, lived on the streets. Good fortune fell his way in that a lady that was uh, part of the British embassy, she had dropped some groceries of some sort, and he had gone over to help her pick them up. She needed help at her place. It was a perfect time. She hired Osfau and at the same time enrolled him into school. Asfal then went to a British school that was there close to where he currently resides. And as he is going to school there, he would have leftover food because he didn't eat that much. He wasn't used to eating very much. And he would take his food out to those kids who were living on the street real close by. There was a church there, and the churches are numerous. They're all over the city. And that's where the poor kind of congregate. Osfau started providing food to these people, and then he went to the administration of the school and said, hey, we have all these people that don't have food. We have all this leftover food. Why are we throwing it in the trash? Let's figure out a system 
And this guy was like 14 years old, coming up with this great way of providing for the homeless. They actually created meal cards that they gave to these people. And Osfeld then began, started teaching education to these homeless kids. In that process, there was at one point, he had over 600 kids that were gathering to hear him teach a little bit about education. Went to the king, actually he threw himself in front of the king's car, and the king stopped and, and he gave some time to Osfal. Osfal explained the situation and he gave them this large land mass. There Osfal has his school. He now has two land masses, really, within the city where he has about 2,300 students right now in his school system. So how does that relate to me and going to Ethiopia? Jeffrey Horbar is the chief scientific officer and CEO of Vermont Oxford Network. Anybody know about Vermont Oxford Network? Yeah, quality improvement. I've been involved with Vaughn since 1992. And through this initiative of going over to Ethiopia, I've gotten to know Jeffrey real well. He and his wife after college had volunteered in Ethiopia, and there they taught at Osfau School. A relationship began there between Osfau and Jeffrey, and as Jeffrey was seeing the improvements of outcomes in the States and in Europe improve so much, he wanted to know, is there a way that possibly we can make a difference in a third world? Of course, he had that relationship already in Ethiopia, so that's where he went. Contacted the director of, or the chief of pediatrics at the Addis Ababa University Medical School, and which is at the Takura and Vesa Hospital, or it stands for Black Lion. Contacted him, brought him over to the States. He went over to Ethiopia along with four other neonatologists. One of those is on my team now with Waxing Gold. And they went there to see what kind of feasibility it would be for people with our education, people with our technological advancements to, be good, to go over to Ethiopia, a place where they have basically nothing in the area of medical care. And could we improve their outcomes? After that, several of us had started volunteering over there in, in how do I back it up, the red? Yeah. At the bottom there, it says the formation of wax and gold. If you think about wax and gold, wax is a covering on the outside of gold. It's the outside meeting, but there's a heavier and deeper meeting on the inside when you get to the gold. It's actually a metaphor, in a way, that the Ethiopians, that all of the older generation, they understand it because they had to use this type of communication in a way that they wouldn't be thrown into jail or something might not happen to them in a physical way from the government during that dirt time. Wax and gold means something to them. It's odd for us. But if you go to waxandgold.org, uh, it will explain a little bit about how we came about wax and gold. So this is Jeffrey and Osfal. This was in, I think, 2012. It's a little old. That Osfal, that we're in his home, actually, and, and Jeffrey is intrigued with Osfal's kids as they're playing some board games. But they have a great relationship, and... Great things have happened because of that. So the project that Vaughn began is called the Takir Mbessa NICU project. And it is aligned with Addis Ababa University, Vermont Oxford Network, and the hospital itself. These are volunteers. Some of you may know some of these people. You may work with some of them. The guy on the bottom left, anybody here from San Diego? Do you all know Carlos? He's awesome, isn't he? So I've worked with Carlos, and he actually is helping the Academy of Pediatrics right now with some specifics in, in Madagascar. So we've gotten to know Carlos through the, the TA project. So this is Danielle Arrett. Danielle is the Director of Global Health at Vaughn. She's been there now for maybe three years. Jeffrey Horbar right there. Some people that, this guy is not any good. This guy right here, Lou Polak, he is in Oakland, California. I think he's been working at Alta Bates. Anybody here from Alta Bates? Lou? Yep. Sorry. And let's see, you know this guy? Thomas Eusterbrock? Yes. So Thomas also is part of our group. And then two more. Suzanne Halley, she's from Boston. Anybody here from Boston? No? No Bostonians? Okay. And then one more. Mizrak Tadesi. She's part of the John Hopkins system, and she's in, where's she at? Somebody told me. 
Where at? Howard County. Howard County. So we have somebody that's from there. So the TA, there's some really neat things that's going on right now with Vaughn. So to give you a concept of what we dealt with. Now, when we first walked into the TA, the unit's called B6. It's on the sixth floor. It's in Unit B. That's their NICU. In their first room, this is what you walked into. They had this long cot, multiple babies in that, in that cot. None of them related to each other. So you got one, two, three, four. I don't know if one's right there. I think there's one right there. There's five or six babies that's in this cot. They had a real high infection rate. Can you imagine? The sickest babies were in this cot. And a new baby that came from labor delivery ward, they'd bring and put in this cot. So you may have a baby that's been there for five days and they're treating for infection, but, and then another baby may die and they just move that baby out and they slide the next baby in close to them. The beauty of all of this is that there's some really good outcomes that have occurred. We got rid of that the first week. And, and they're, what's really cool is they're happy about it. When you show them the evidence, that, that's when we actually usually act upon something, right? Has anybody seen one of these? This is how they deliver oxygen to their patients. And unfortunately, they have actually gone back to this concept. They, just, they use this manifold that has multiple stopcocks. And each one of those stopcocks will take oxygen by nasal cannula to the next patient. But if you can imagine, you set that flow meter at, let's just say they set it at five, and they have five of them opened up, who's getting what? You really don't know, right? We were able to advance it by the next year to this next system, which is we were able to create a manifold off of the wall and be able to put individual flow meters. And then each patient was able to get their own flow. And we saw improvements through that. I don't have a picture of how they actually deliver it to the patient, but many times they use IV tubing because in the third world, they do not have budgets to purchase things. So consumables is almost unknown unless somebody brings it. So they'll take IV tubing, they'll cut off the end of, a, for example, a butterfly needle, they'll break off the needle, they'll figure out a way to attach it to the oxygen tubing, and they'll tape the end of the tube off of the butterfly, and they'll tape it to their nose. And there's, there, I can go on and on. So this room right here, what's important about this picture is that this room was a room that we saw as being the best potential for the small babies, but it was the storage room. Not only was it the storage room, but if you look in the middle, is a big table. That was the procedure table. So when a baby needed lab draws or they had to have an exchange transfusion, which it was not uncommon for them to do three to five exchange transfusions a day. Because what do you think the number one reason would be? RH. So that has improved dramatically. But anyways, this room has gone from, let me back up. The lady in white, that is Mizrak Tadesi. She's one of our partners. And then next to her, that's Sister Brahan, Brahan Mulat. She is, she's no longer, but she was the head nurse for many years. And I tell you what, somehow that lady was able to keep things together in a way that doesn't make sense to me. And we're really good friends today. So that's what the unit we were able to accomplish after three years. We were able to, to build some blended, blended, or not build, but create blended oxygen for them. I have a picture, it's just beautiful, it's the blender, and then we have an oxygen analyzer right next to it. Both of them set, or the blender set at 60%, and it's analyzing 60%. When we did that, they were just like in awe. They were like, wow, cause what did they get up to this point? 100% oxygen, regardless. It, there's 92 to 97% in one of the H cylinders, but by the time that it entrains with the room air, we really don't know how much oxygen they're getting. But of course, the lower the flow or lower the CPAP, they're getting less. So the things that we accomplished from 2009 to the environment, you saw the changes there. Management guidelines, just in how the residents managed their time and their team with the patients. We did a lot of different things with the nursing staff. We attempted to put them on 12-hour shifts because to us that just makes sense, only to learn that being able to get from point A to point B in Addis Ababa and maybe you live outside the city it may not be that easy for them. Traveling was a big issue that we never really thought of. So any of y'all heard of cultural differences? <laughs> right? So there's a lot of things that we learned uh, the hard way just because we didn't quite understand culture. Medical practice. So in the picture, I don't know, did you guys see 
Let me back it up. Anybody know this guy right here? Ziegler? So he did a lot of stuff on uh, nutrition. And thankfully, he joined us in Ethiopia because he was able to come up with uh, different formulations depending on what circumstance. We use mom's milk with, with uh, powdered milk, with water, uh, with different additives, things to get us uh, the calories and, and the nutrition that the patients needed. Um, thankfully, shortly after that, the government was, was open for us using formula in times where there was a disconnect. The mother may have been in another city. She wasn't able to come with the baby. The baby's by itself. It's got to it's got to drink something, right? Can't drink the the watered down milk that we learned that they were getting, which was skimmed milk. Wondering why the babies weren't growing, and we learned that. What's, let me back up. The medical side didn't know that they had changed the milk, but the people that were inside the cafeteria that prepared the milk for them, they knew of it. They said we knew something was wrong because it started looking really watery. So it was all because there's one baby failure to thrive. We started looking at the chart. It didn't make sense. Why is this baby? And we went to the, then to the cafeteria. We talked to the cafeteria workers, and that's when we learned that the baby was getting skim milk. The two arms are not talking to each other, which is pretty frequent. Education, my goodness, so many different things have been done with the education. Fellowship, we graduated Dr. Azrat Hailu and Goitum. Dr. Azrat is very much involved currently at Vaughn, or with Vaughn, working on a project to teach neonatal nurse practitioners. But I bring you this picture right here because this is really, to me, the number one thing that has really given us success in going to Ethiopia. So if you go to another country in the third world and you're providing service, the number one thing that we have to do is develop relationships. If you don't develop a relationship, you don't develop trust. And so by a solid, good relationship with these individuals, over time you develop trust, and through trust, they are then willing to give you an open platform to help teach them. Several of these people are really good friends. One person I want to point out, this girl right here, right here. her name is Radit. Radit actually works, we're supplementing her salary a little bit, but she's the first nurse educator that we've been able to develop at St. Paul, St. Paul's Hospital. She has her master's in public health, very bright. Several of these girls all graduate around the same time, very bright. Currently, today is Tuesday, right? Yesterday, on Monday, for Mon Oxford Network, Jeffrey and Danielle were there, and they are celebrating the first Ethiopian neonatal network one-year anniversary. Right now, they have 22 hospitals in Ethiopia that are submitting their data, just like we do here with Vaughn. This is where they're located. Right now, our focus where we're doing our work is in Addis Ababa. The majority of the people, this is what's called the Rift Valley, which is a pretty fertile area. You see there's nothing here. It's pretty desert. It's, there's not really much life out there. There's tribes that still live there, but it's not any place to put a, a neonatal ICU. So the health tier system is very much like what we have here in the States. You have hospitals and clinics and so forth that feed into hospital systems. We are at, so two hospitals. Primarily right now where I am at is at St. Paul's, but we are still at the Black Lion with Vaughn. You can see that each of the tertiary care centers, the specialized hospitals, they're responsible for three and a half to five million people each, which is a lot. We'll talk about some numbers here in a minute. Ethiopia hired over 25,000 healthcare workers about four years ago. People that wanted to be involved in healthcare, maybe they didn't have more than a high school education, and they were able to teach them about the simple things, immunizations and so forth, hygiene, and they put them in these what they call health posts. And there are several health posts around the country to try to disseminate this information. So taking us from within side Addis Ababa, where this purple mark right here, that is the hotel that we stay at. The hotel is within walking distance. We take some back roads, and then we come in back here, and, and right here is the hospital, St. Paul's, where we're at. Gives you another little bit of an idea of what the whole area looks like. All of this is becoming the cardiac and GI hospital. Right over here is renal transplant. In April of last year, they had completed 
67 renal transplants with only two rejections. They've done a really good job. University of Michigan is working with them. New hospital is right here. Every year that I go, they're going to open it up in, on Friday. And it still hasn't happened. The beauty, though, of this new hospital is that they've actually installed an oxygen generation plant. It is state of the art. It came from Canada. I've witnessed it. It's true. I didn't think it would happen when I heard it was going to happen. But it's, it's uh, right down in here. And it's incredible. They have two systems in case one breaks down, which it will. And they also have the ability to fill bottles. So they'll actually become a distribution center for other hospitals that will pay for the service. So hopefully they'll be able to generate some funding with that. Okay, so St. Paul. Why are we there? St. Paul is one of the 13 public referral hospitals. They have just really increased the amount of hospitals that are going on in Ethiopia. It's one of the two centers of excellence. The black line is one, and St. Paul is the other. It's the highest risk delivery center in Ethiopia. Can you imagine? Does anybody have 4,000 NICU patients? I'm not talking deliveries. I'm talking NICU patients that, that are put in a logbook. Incredible numbers that, that roll through. They have a medical college and a nursing college uh, attached with them. And of course, the, they have the largest annual delivery service in Ethiopia. The black line is right behind them pretty close. So how did we get involved in kind of the programs that we're doing at the Black, Black Lion. Did you have a chance to see or visit Dr. Wendy when he came? So he actually came to the States because he was attending a seminar about nursing empowerment. Pretty good conference, right? If we can empower the nurses there who really have no more of a role than like maid service almost, if we can empower them, we can make a difference. So he saw that this was something that would work great for him. Through the process of being in Ethiopia, working at the Black Lion a year at St. Paul prior to this that we're going to talk about, is that we've learned that the stabilization that they're providing the patients is not adequate. When you have an in-house delivery service that's admitting patients to the NICU at the same rate or of hypothermia at the same rate as outpatients coming in, there's a problem. These are some of the things that we've learned as we've been there. The, there's no NICU nurses involved with delivery service whatsoever. Physician delivers, a midwife who is not a nurse midwife, but has uh, gone through the midwifery uh, program out of high school. They didn't do whatever they did, and then they'd bring you this kid that had never been resuscitated. So a patient would show up and need resuscitation. 30% NICU admission rate, just nearly 30% admitted from the delivery ward. 90% was the number that we could come up with of babies born less than 36.5. Now, they weren't keeping data, so we don't know what the numbers were. We just know that was a diagnosis on admission. And the definition of their hypothermia follows the WHO, which is 36.5. Hypothermia is universally a significant sign of sepsis. So every baby that's admitted for hypothermia is also admitted for suspected sepsis, and on antibiotics. So we came up with uh, an education plan uh, for what we called neonatal advanced life support. Different things of our curriculum we did. Are you guys familiar with the NOEP orientation program that's by A1? We took some information out of that that prepared us to be able to then began to teach them about resuscitation because we wanted to train a set group of nurses that would attend babies in the delivery ward, and that's their own sole responsibility. Stable and NRP is really the platform from which we stand on. That is the core of their background when we're teaching them. And then you've heard of HPV, ECB, CSB as part of the AAP trainings that they're providing in third world countries. We did about 120 hours of didactic time, along with about 110 hours of true hands-on training. Most of the people that go to Ethiopia and provide some kind of form of training 
It's usually in the way of a lecture or a seminar. The people in Ethiopia, they told us that they've never had anybody actually go in and do hands-on training with their patients. When I say in Ethiopia, I'm talking about St. Paul. That's where we're at right now. This is the group that we graduated out the first time. This is Suzanne from Boston and Mizrak from Howard County in Maryland. They look excited. Let me tell you, those girls are empowered. This is part of the training. It's more of a, the HPV time here. This is Dr. Antenna. We worked with him at the Black Lion when he was a resident. And this is Guess It. And Guess It is now going through a neonatology fellowship with us at St. Paul. He just got back from doing actually hands-on training in India. And then we're doing some simulation stuff right here. With, this is all part of the HP, which was the initial training. The only thing I want to show you that's really funny is I had to pull clothes off. It was, oh my God, it's like I was in hell. <laughs> I looked pretty intense for two reasons. One, I had sweat dropping off all parts of my body. And number two, they had these radiant warmers that they were not using. They were brand new. And we asked them, why are you not using those radiant warmers? They said that they're obnoxious. What do you mean they're obnoxious? Part of the language barrier here, they smelled really bad. You know why? Because they had them on temp control. The temp probe's hanging off the back of the, ink, the radiant warmer so that it's doing nothing but 100% heat. So it was almost melting the beds, what it was. I was just teaching them about servo control and all that. So this is the hands-on that I'm talking about. So right here you have Mizrak. And you really can't tell. I have an awesome video of Suzanne that's actually, this right here was our star student. She was actually a midwife, still is a midwife. In fact, this week she's presenting to uh, the OB department, it's the first time a nurse has ever been allowed to uh, have a voice, and she's presenting the data from uh, the NALS. Anyways, the video I have that's really cool is Suzanne's actually behind her, and is actually guiding her hands. L luckily, this patient only needs a little bit of CPAP, but she's actually guiding her hands and showing her, counting with her. Uh, with, with a live baby there in her presence. So this is just about data collection. We did create a, a computerized data system. This is, we've all seen this, right? We all have a logbook in the NICU. But look at the numbers. So this is one of the problems. Is look, you go from 4,099, 4,100, then what? 5,000, we lost 900, right? <laughs> So we automatically just gained 900 more babies on admission. So that's some of the problems that we ran into when we went through the logbook and we tried to pull data for our, for our paper. And, and this is a paper that was written back in 2014, International Journal of Quality and Healthcare. And they're just basically just talking about how the medical records are very difficult to, to follow and to grasp when it comes to outcomes. So this is the paper sheet of the data collection that we created for every baby that the advanced life support personnel provided care to a baby. It's a lot of information right there, but I'm, I'm here to tell you they worked two to three of the ALS nurses per shift, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so they work really well as a team. And when I'm telling you about empowerment, they kick people out. They are doing such a good job, and I'll show you the, the numbers here in a second. So, so this was the paper sheet. Well, we felt like for us to, to pull data easily, we really need to figure out a, 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 an electronic way to do it. When you do a data sheet, these are the things that you always struggle with, and that is, are we collecting what we need to collect? Is the data that we're collecting going to be usable, or is it just a, a waste of our time? Are we just filling in? Uh, numbers, which I'll tell you, that last sheet that you saw, and even to this day, I'll stand here and tell you that we have way too much because we're not going to use it. You have to find common interests between the obstetrical and the neonatal because we're in the obstetrical world. We're in their department. Um, and the bottom line is, is that uh, we want to create a computerized system, in which we did. Um, this is the computerized system. About four months after we started collecting data, I was sitting with one of the ALS nurses that was inputting data, and I said, 
Now, how are you guys keeping up with it? Because we wanted to be able to provide a payment to them to do this extra work. We thought that they would come in on their days off to do it. We learned that that is not what they wanted. They said, this is our data. We don't want to get paid for it. This is our job. Now, when that happened, sorry, they get it. This is theirs. We're nothing but a vessel. So we looked at some, some outcome data, right? Because if we're going to collect data, let's do something with it. If we're not going to do something with it, why are we doing it? So we looked at mortality. We looked at the transfer rate admission to the NICU. And then we looked at some other things. But we also looked at hypothermia because that was one of the big things that we really wanted to improve. So we felt like if we can improve hypothermia, we could eliminate a lot of these admissions of patients that look septic or babies that look hypoxic. So just to throw in a few little pictures here, this is what their overcrowdedness looks like. None of these patients, so we got rid of the long bed, right? <laughs> we just created another direction, really. And what's interesting is when you look at all these babies, you look at one of them is really tiny, actually these two, compared to some of the others. So they're going to have some different temperature ranges, right? So we looked at the transfer rate from the delivery room to the NICU. We were able to look at the, the logbook and be able to come up with this number. So they had 472 out of 2,066 for 22.8% admission from the NICU. That's pretty high, isn't it? Right? Most of us are around 10, some places some 12 maybe. So after we started the ALS program, so the dates, I'll give those, I'll be absolute here. On this one right here, we looked at the patients from June 4th to September 17th. The second one is June 4th to, to September 17th, but in 2017. This was 2016, 2017. Now this, we hadn't had the ALS program going for very long. The ALS program was floundering because they were trying to work out this contractual stuff with the hospital. They finally got that all dealt with. So then we looked at another data set. And we looked at November 27th, 2017 to May 24th, 2018. And this is where if you have the handout thing, it's totally different. So th this right here, look at the change in the difference. This is now what we're looking at here in the Western, 10.4% from the delivery room. Hypothermia. We know that babies were born and admitted hypothermic, but we didn't have a number without actually going and breaking down every chart that was in logbook, which that's not even uh, doable. The, the first column doesn't have any data set at all. The second one, we're looking at babies that were less than 36.5. So it's just backwards. What we have here is in the first set, after the ALS, that was that first group from, 2000, from May to September in 2017, we see that we have a 44%, 44.6% of babies were born with normal temperature. Okay? And then you go to the last one. It's kind of backwards the way it's printed here. But we were down to almost 12% hypothermic rate. From 90% was the guesstimate that we had after starting the program to 45% and then to 88% normal. This is Tigus, the one that I told you was probably one of my worst students. She was, have you ever worked with a nurse that's really uncoordinated? <laughs> Tigus is that one. But look what she says. There's no reason for a baby to be hypothermic. There will not be any more hypothermic babies on my watch. It's pretty bold. Alum, I realized I wasn't a nurse until I started participating in this program. And then Free, Free says, I'm in awe that this baby that would have otherwise basically died and just put off to the side. This kid was sucking, was warm, was interacting with his mother. She realized that it only takes a little. So just having a good concrete setup. This right here is absolutely astounding to me. So early mortality in the labor ward. So they had, at, in that first cohort, 2,066 babies. 73 of those babies had died in the labor ward. So then we looked at, after the ALS had first began, they were able to drop it down to 1%. But even more incredible is this last set. And this is with them working on full force under their own direction, under their own scheduling, 
they were able to drop it down to 0.3%, uh, which is incredible. So combined mortality. So you look at the mortality of the NICU and the delivery ward, it's still pretty high. So 7.2% before the LS and 4.2% afterwards. It's able to drop it down 3%. But what I want to bring out, and, and I didn't really cover it here, I, I believe, yeah, that's one of the things I changed, was that when we looked at the mortality rate of babies that died in less than 24 hours after admission to the NICU, it was way down. Looked at babies that died at 48 hours, it was still down, much less than overall NICU mortality. But where we saw a big difference or, or a big eye-opener is that overall mortality didn't change. Other outcomes, this is just some stuff. This is just showing you that this is nurses that are working. Sadly, that, or is that there are more nurses in Malawi and Manchester than that's actually in Malawi. So the nurses are getting trained, but they're leaving. And that's one of the problems you have with third world country. This is the double decker. So they were out of room, and the nurses came up with, I, I mean, if you think about it, it's pretty cool that they thought this through. They figured out the way to make a double decker. I'm not going to tell you how the babies did, but at least they thought it through. So current projects that we're working on. The neonatal advanced life support, we have that on hold. The next group that we teach will be to train the trainers. We're doing a phototherapy project. We've developed a L&D phototherapy unit that we can build and sell for about $500, which has intensive heat, or not heat, sorry, irradiance, sorry. Of course, we're advisors for all the things that they're doing for procurement. We hired a nurse educator. She's awesome. She's done some really cool things already. Established the simulation training center. We had a neonatal group that came out of Sweden and created the SEPS program, and they've already used that in an infection control bundle with the NICU. We are trying to get a respiratory care program started this week. The African Union is meeting in Ethiopia, which is the, where the African Union is at, and they're going to have a break off of health care in the private sector. So Bill and Melinda Gates will be there, so they're trying to figure out how to get the private sector involved in health care and how to improve it in Ethiopia. And then right now we are we're in the process of procuring the NOEP, which is the neonatal orientation program that A1 has. And this is what we're going to use for all the NICU nurses in, in the NICU. This is the new NICU. So th these are head walls. So they will actually have the ability to blend, getting rid of those oxygen tanks. This is in the step-down unit. So if there's some babies that still need a little bit of oxygen, they'll be able to have it. So what are we doing? So we're looking for volunteers. Looking, so Vermont Oxford Network, they have just started a neonatal nurse practitioner program. They actually call it a residency program. And they're looking for staff that would be willing to come for three to four weeks. Te typically, you'd be teamed with a physician. Dr. Carlos Ramos has been with nurse. And then Bond will cover the cost of airfare in the hotel. With Wax and Gold, same thing, but we're asking for a little bit less time. It's hard to get a lot of time taken away. And we're looking at trying to have nurses on the ground every month. Because <clears throat> I'll tell you, when I first started going with Vaughn, do you remember Sister Berhan that was in there cleaning that one room? She looked up at me, and I'm quite a bit taller than her. She looks up at me like this, and she said, if you don't come back, everything that you're teaching us, we will not follow through. It will all go away. Because... There's no accountability. But they know you're coming back. They don't want to disappoint you. And I've learned a lot from that. I haven't missed a year. Currently, the five of us in, on Wax and Gold, we go twice a year. So that covers between eight and ten months out of the year. We have one other volunteer that's been multiple times, and he is now taking his own team. A team basically consists of two people but it could be two, three, or four people that go at the same time. This is nasal cannulas hanging to dry after they clean them. One hospital that we've worked with, Gandhi Memorial Hospital, they had seven nasal cannulas for the whole year. Bulb syringes, cannulas that are ready to be used for patients. That's the buckets on the left. They use chlorine bleach. All right. 
Anybody know what this is? What did I hear? It's bubble seat fat. Some of us that are old enough that this is almost what we started using back in the 80s. But they'll use anything that they can to be able to create that water tension, be able to deliver that pressure. We're trying to improve this, by the way. This is Anders Dolstrom. He's the one from Sweden. What's he doing? What's he doing? What was that? Telemed? No. Close. I just heard. Debriefing. One of the things that we're using with training these nurses is debriefing. Do we learn from debriefing? I tell you what I do. I probably learned more from debriefing. These people were in awe. They were like, that's me? I know I can do better. And they just continue to work on it. Anders is internationally known for his training. He uses what's called the SEPS program. It can be used with adults also. What could they use? I've had different people say, is there something I can do? There's no way I can go. I would love for nurses to take complete control of the disposables. And you look at some of this stuff and you think, my God, I would never put a used feeding tube and advocate for that to go on another patient. But where we're working, they don't buy consumables. They only have what we carry in our suitcases. There's been times that we've had things confiscated from our suitcases because they don't allow us to bring it in. Recently, there's something that has happened at the government level. They've backed off of us. So when we come in, they're not even stopping us and searching our suitcases. I had about $10,000 of used pulse oximeters that were confiscated once, and I had three brand new phototherapy units that were confiscated from me once. What happens is the government takes it, they, they sell it, they auction it off, which is then it gets to the private sector who can afford it. So if, if you have the ability to provide any of these things, please get a hold of me. I'd love to talk to you about it. If you use the T-piece resuscitator that has the manometer built into it, that's really the ideal for a resuscitation bag. I don't have the picture currently of a resuscitation bag that they, you can just imagine, washing the resuscitation bag in a chlorine bleach water, how it begins to disintegrate, degenerate over time. But if that's all you got, you're going to use it. These are the contacts if, if you want to get a hold of anybody. I think you all probably know Kathy, myself on the bottom, and then Vaughn, and you could also put info at waxandgold.org. So this is the new group. Notice they have the same shirt as was seen in the other group. There, there's something about these shirts that empowers these nurses that it gives them an identity that they belong there. Wanted to show you some of the good things that's happened. I showed you some ugly ones, but I'll show you just a couple of these. So we're trying to treat, teach them a little bit about neurodevelopmental care. This nurse right here is really sharp. And this is a group that met at Vaughn this past year at the Global Health Breakout. And thank you. I'm just going to... Thank you, Philip. We have come to the end of our silent night in the NICU series for this holiday month of December 2023. I hope that you enjoyed hearing that presentation from Philip, that you're inspired to actually give back in a small way, whether that's with your time, with your money, or with your expertise. We all have something to offer to others in other parts of the world. So I hope that this gives you a roadmap and some inspiration of the ways in which you could give back. Um, the other thing, of course, in the spirit of giving is give this video a thumbs up. Go ahead back to our YouTube channel, click that like and subscribe button, and let YouTube know that you like videos like this. It really helps us to bring you more free content. Um, if you'd like the resources from this month's presentations, go ahead and click the link in the show notes below or somewhere on the screen there's a QR code. Scan that and you'll go immediately to a page where you enter your email address and you'll get access to all the resources, the replays, and we will stay in touch with you about future lives. Again, this is Kathy Randall from Synapse Care Solutions. I'm wishing you a very Merry Christmas, a Happy Holidays, a Happy New Year, and I really look forward to seeing you in 2024 year, and I will see you next time.